Good morning, friends. The Lord be with you. What a joy to welcome you to worship on this beautiful day outside. We're glad that you are here to offer God your praise and uh, your prayers. He is worthy of our worship for certain. Um, let me just say a few things. The bulletin, if you might note, has no inserts today. That is an intentional effort, so you don't have to look through all kinds of papers. Um, but that means there are some things that aren't in there that are normally in there. So you signing up on the friendship pad and putting your email is really important to get the e-news during the midweek and the call and all of those announcements that go out. So please note that that is uh, part of the deal to have less paper, is that uh, we want to send you the information and we need your email address. So as you sign the friendship pads this morning, if you do not receive uh, the emails from the church, please be sure to include your email address. And those who are online, good morning to you and welcome. Likewise, would you please sign the virtual friendship pad? And if you do not receive uh, the e-news or the call, please include your email address so we can send those announcements, ministry opportunities uh, for you that way. Also, the prayer list is not in the bulletin, but is at every door for you to pick up. So if you want the prayer list, please make sure you pick those up as well. And just to highlight a few things on the prayer list, Tom Codel had um, a test and a procedure this week, and he's waiting to see how that works out. So continue to pray for Tom and Harriet. Mike Gatos had a successful procedure on Friday. He's at home resting and also waiting for some test results. So please uh, pray for the Gatos family also. On the other side of praise, um, this morning I was informed by Sharon that they are new grandparents again. Jack Gerard Long was born this weekend to Jason and Megan. Uh, so Daryl and Sharon are grandparents again. And Barb is now six-time great-grandparent. And we are excited about that. And it's um, important to note that Jack is named after his great-grandpa, Jack, and that is exciting. Wanted to let you know that for the next three Sundays, uh, so next week, November 5th, we'll have communion, and it is All Saints Day. So we will celebrate our members who have passed this last year and remember them and say thanks to God for their witness. Uh, on, on November 12th, we will uh, bring our Operation Christmas Child boxes uh, to dedicate them on November 19th. We ask you to make sure your estimate of giving cards are in, and we will also have a congregational meeting to elect our new officers. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot going on. I'm going to invite Sue Richard to come on up, and she's going to share a little bit about the uh, grief small group that we're going to have. Good morning, church. Good morning. Grief is a hard topic to discuss, especially as we approach the holidays. It's a deep and devastating sorrow that follows a profound loss. We normally think of grief when we think of someone who has died, but grief can occur after any life-altering loss or change, such as divorce, job or financial loss, chronic illness, a prodigal child, or lost relationship. Grief is a physical, emotional, and spiritual event. A few things, and few things can rock your world and shake your faith like grief. We ask why this happened and we get no answers. We can feel angry, lost, abandoned, and hopeless and often we get stuck in our grief. Loss and grief are a universal result of living in a fallen and sinful world, and we as Christians are not exempt. But as Christians, we do not have to grieve as others do because God understands our sufferings and has promised to be with us in suffering. As Christians, we can grieve with hope, but often we don't know how to find that hope. 
Through the Psalms of Lament, we can see how David and others um, poured out their pain, anger, frustration, and hopelessness to God, and how God met them in their suffering, held them up, and gave them hope. If you have suffered a recent loss or feel that you have not resolved a past loss, please join Ruthie Reith Miller and I as we lead a six-week grief small group beginning on November 6th. Ruthie is our Stevens Ministry Director, and I have a background in nursing, a degree in counseling, and I'm also a Stephen minister. Through the Psalms, we will help you develop Christ-centered tools to approach your situation and help you navigate the upcoming holidays. This will be a closed group, meaning that only those who have signed up can attend due to the confidential nature of the issues and the need to build trust within the group. Please sign up for the Grief Small Group using the Stevens Ministry email address located in the bulletin or on the church website where you will find the Grief Small Group information. Thank you. Last night, Van and I came home from spending uh, just two days at the Weekend to Remember Family Life Marriage Conference that's happening in Cranberry. And I wanted to encourage anyone who has any, any concern or has any interest at all, there is a yet another conference this coming weekend up in Cranberry, Weekend to Remember. There's information on inserts at the doors. You can sign up under the church's code. If you have questions, you can come and ask me. But it is a great uh, experience and really uh, affirming of God's covenant of marriage. Let's take a moment, stand and greet those around you. Share the peace of Christ with one another.
Today is uh, the Sunday we celebrate Reformation, and Reformation is a part of our heritage. We are part of the Protestant Reformation, and our theology is Reformed. And you may ask, why uh, do we celebrate that today? Well, actual Reformation Day is October 31st, because on that date, Philip Melanchthon said it was that date that Martin Luther put the 95 theses that he had against the Roman Church uh, and nail them on the door of the church at Wittenberg. So you will note that our opening hymn, A Mighty Fortress, is written by Martin Luther, and he used the text of Psalm 46 to write that hymn, and so we're going to use that psalm as our call to worship. Let's come before the Lord. God is our refuge and strength, a very he- present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake and tremble at its swelling. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Be still and know that He is God. He will be exalted among the nations. We will be exalted in the earth. Let us stand and sing our opening hymn together.
Let's pray, friends. God, You are eternal. You had no beginning and have no end. You always are. You are the constant, the one who is the same. And Your truth never changes. Thank You that You are faithful in Your love for us and that we have seen that love in the gift of Jesus Christ, your Son, to be our Savior. And you have not left us alone in this life or on this world, but you have provided for us the gift of your Holy Spirit, the power to live faithfully in Christ's name, to know your presence, to live in the light of grace and walk in your truth. We are here to say thank you for who you are. Thank you for all that you have done for us in Christ. Thank you that you have not left us alone and are with us still in your spirit. May you be honored and glorified as we bring our offerings of praise today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Our call to confession today is from Romans chapter 3. It says, As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Realizing that this is a description of our own sin nature, let us in repentance confess our sin together using the words of Psalm 51 in our bulletins. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. For the sake of the Savior, we ask this. Amen. Romans 3 continues, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ, to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace 
through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Pro tip. Um, good morning. Uh, I've been asked to speak this morning about our family's understanding of stewardship. Uh, so to prepare, I asked my wife, Nicole, out of the blue, why do you tithe? Die, she said. No, tithe, I said. Dive, she said. No, tithe. <laughs> this happens a lot in our house, and um, I can only imagine it'll get worse as we age. Uh, but once we agreed on what we were talking about, we discussed several reasons why giving is important for us. You've heard several of these reasons this past month during this moment for stewardship. One reason is that it's a, giving is a practical way to support our church family. And another reason is that giving recognizes all the ways that we've been blessed. It's a way of giving thanks to God for our blessings. However, this morning I want to focus on another reason. Uh, and this reason is the, one of the reasons why I think giving is, is important because I think giving is actually a spiritual discipline. Uh, I believe how we think about our resources, our time, our money, our energy and talents has an impact on our relationship with God. I think our resources can be a source of independence, and I think that independence can lead us away from God and to a focus on ourselves and our story rather than a focus on what God is doing. I think that's actually the message Jesus delivers to the rich young ruler in the three synoptic gospels. Uh, the story, as you probably know, goes that the uh, the rich young man asked Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life. Uh, and he says he's kept the law since he was young. He's both obedient and wealthy, and yet somehow he still feels like something is missing in his life, that he lacks something. Jesus looks at him with love and tells him, sell everything you have and give all the money to the poor. And the story ends with the man going away sad because he has great wealth. So I find this story um, challenging. I, I even find it haunting. Uh, I admit that I'm often resource obsessed and I feel like I don't have enough time or energy or talent or money and that somehow all I have been given is not enough. Like the young man, I'm far from selling everything I have and giving it away. Instead, I often feel that if I could just get a little bit more, things would be better. I more often relate to the psalmist of Psalm 73, which is one of my favorite psalms. The psalmist writes, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for they have no pain. Their bodies are sound and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not plagued like other people. Always at ease, they increase in riches. I feel the temptation the psalmist writes about, the temptation to put our faith in the acclamation of money, the need for more resources, and the hoarding of our time and energy. So for me, stewardship is about rejecting the temptation to put faith in resources and instead putting my faith in God, who is the giver of all good gifts. Giving is a very concrete way to do this. And that's why I think, we, why I think it can be thought of as a spiritual discipline. It's a conc concrete way of trusting in God rather than trusting in ourselves. It's about rejecting the world's economy and instead trusting in God's economy. The psalmist ends with a picture of this attitude of dependence when he writes, Whom have I in heaven but you? and there is nothing on earth that I desire other than you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Will you please pray with me? Lord, 
Thank you for all the ways that you bless us, meeting both our practical needs and our spiritual needs. Thank you for our daily bread. Help us to grow in our faith, to trust in your kingdom to come, and to grow in our dependence on you. Bless these gifts that we give now, and use both the gifts and our giving of these gifts to your glory. Amen. Let us remain standing as we affirm our faith together using the words from Ephesians chapter 2, which is in our bulletin. God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You may be seated. This is just a reminder that once again, following this prayer, we will be singing the Lord's Prayer, and that can be found in your hymnal number 632. But let us come to the Lord in prayer. God, our Creator, and the one who is over all things, 
we come to you with thanks for the mighty works that you have done all throughout history and also the great things you've done in our lives. Give us eyes to see how in years past you have delivered your people and continued loving them, even through their disobedience. And help us to see it is our story too, that even in our sin, you came to save us and have given to us Jesus, our Savior. We are so grateful for this love and this gift, and we desire to express our thanks, not only through words, but also through the lives we live. God, we are thankful for your church, that through Christ we have a family that reaches across the world and spans throughout the ages. And we thank you for the many expressions of worship that are seen in those places and how they point others to your greatness and majesty. And we pray for our church here at Elfenwild, that through our worship, fellowship with one another, service, and many forms of outreach, that we will effectively shine the light of Jesus for all to see. And Lord, we also pray that the light we shine as individuals and families will remain bright, even through hardship. Give us strength to endure long days and energy to engage with the people around us. God, there are times when we are really at a loss and not sure how to move forward, but we continue trusting in you. We know we cannot do anything in this life apart from you. So we ask that you strengthen us in our inner being so that Christ can dwell in our hearts and we can be assured that we have everything we need. God, we ask that you hear the prayers of our hearts, the things we share with others and the things we don't. We are grateful that you know us through and through that you love us, care for us, and answer our prayers. Hear now our prayers of thanks and our petitions for those things that are heavy on our hearts. We thank you, God, for your compassion and provision. Help us to turn to you giving thanks in all circumstances and having the assurance of your love through Jesus. We thank you, God, that when we are unsure of what words to use to pray, you have provided scripture, including the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Hear us now as we sing these words together.
I hope after that we all believe. <laughs> Scripture this morning is from the book of Ruth, and I invite you to turn there. It's page 263. I'm not necessarily going to read the chapter 2, but um, Ruth is only four chapters. So if you turn to page 263, you'll be really close uh, to what I'm going to read. Before we turn to the Word of God and uh, sort of catch up where we are in God's story, let me pray for us. Thank you, God, for the gift of Scripture, your revelation of how you have worked in the world from the very beginning, how you have provided all that is needed even a Savior, a Redeemer. And what your plan is for eternity, that there is time ahead. We pray that you would open our eyes, that we might see, but open our hearts, that we might receive and know and be assured of your grace that is sufficient for us. In Jesus Christ, help us to believe. In his name we pray, amen. So we talked last Sunday about the judges, men and women whom God raised up in time of need when the nation of Israel was falling away and had turned away from God. And those men and women we call judges, Uh, Through their faithfulness, by God's grace, the nation turned back. Israel turned back to the Lord. They repented, and God blessed them and prospered them. and, And then the cycle happened all over again, and they turned away, and he had to raise up another judge, and they turned back again. And that just went on and on. Well, during that time, and in the time of the judges, there is this Um, other story in the book of Ruth um, that I think is very revealing for us and very important that we look at. And again, friends, you have the advantage if you're here to go right from here to Sunday school because there's a lot to undertake in these four chapters. So many things to talk about. We can't cover them in these 15 minutes. But here's the story. There is a lady named Naomi, and Naomi is married to a man named Elimelech, and there's a famine, and they move from Israel, and they leave, and they go to the country of Moab, uh, and they take their two sons, Malan and Kilian, and they go there, and while they're in Moab, um, Malan and Kilian get married to Moabite women, not to Israelis, not to Israelites. And in that time there in Moab, Moab, Naomi's husband Elimelech dies, and she is left a widow. And for a woman in that day to be without a husband meant that she was at without a provider, without a protector, without a defender. But at least she had her two sons who could step in and fill that role once their father had died. And then what happens? But both of her sons die. And she is left without a husband and without her sons. And she has two daughters-in-law. One of the daughters-in-law leaves and is right to leave because she needs to go find someone who might provide for her since her husband has died. But the other daughter-in-law is Ruth. And Ruth very famously says, uh, I will not leave you. Where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. And even though Naomi encourages her to go and find another husband so that she might be supplied for, Ruth insists. And there's a great kindness and love, if you will, that Ruth has for Naomi and shares with her. So Naomi and Ruth return to Israel. 
since they have no way to support themselves in Moab. And when they return, they are still without husbands. And again, in that culture, they, that meant they were not provided for. But there are relatives in Israel, relatives of Naomi's husband, Elimelech. And part of the responsibility of a family in those days was to provide for your family if your brother or son or even cousin dies, that you will step up and be the kinsman or the relative who will help redeem or provide for the widow who has been left or the children who have been left. And it just so happens that there are relatives of Elimelech's in Israel. Uh, One of them, and we are going to read about him in just a minute, his name is Boaz. But there was a closer relative than Boaz who had the initial right and responsibility to step up and in to this void and vacuum for Naomi and Ruth. And we'll see in a moment that he decides not to, but that Boaz does. I think it's really important for us to remember that in that culture, in the law, in what was understood, that family, that kin, people who were related to you, had a responsibility. As an illustration, uh, 20 years ago when I went to Malawi on a mission trip, I stayed in a home with a couple who had three children of their own, but they were also supporting and had five other nephews and nieces who lived with them in their house because their brothers or brothers and sisters were unable to provide for one reason or another. It was just expected and understood that those who could provide would. And there was some safety and redemption in that. So I want us to look at um, chapter 4, really. Um, Ruth, as a little bit more background, goes to the fields of Boaz to glean the harvest. That means that after the workers of the field would harvest the grain, that women often would come after them and they would pick up the leftovers. They would glean what was left, what was left for scrap. And that's how they would survive and live. And so Ruth was sent by Naomi to go into the fields of Boaz, a relative of Limelech's, and to glean the harvest there. And Boaz recognized and was told who Ruth was. And he invited her to glean in his fields and told his men to leave her alone and to keep her safe and to make sure that she's provided for. And in that relationship, Boaz gets to know Ruth. Ruth comes home and reports it to Naomi, and she's hopeful. She's hopeful that maybe Boaz will step up and be the redeemer for Naomi and Ruth. It should be noted that at one point, Naomi, when she returned to Israel and was greeted by the other women, said to them, they greeted her with Naomi. She said, oh no, call me Mara. And the name Mara means bitter. I'm bitter. I'm without. Chapter 4, hear the word of God. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken, that's the closer relative, came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down, and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, that closer kin to Elimelech, Naomi who has come back for the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. 
It's talking about the land here. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And Boaz said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, or I'm sorry, the relative said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said to that relative, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Do you get that? Not only do you have the chance to redeem the land of our relative, but along with that comes the responsibility to perpetuate his family. In other words, you are responsible for Naomi, Naomi and Ruth as well. <laughs> then in verse 6, the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Let's keep going. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilian and Malan. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malan, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead will not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses to this day. Then all the people who are at the gate and elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah, and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. Do you get what's happening here? Boaz has stepped up and stepped in to help the hurting widow, Naomi, and the destitute and desperate widow, Ruth. He gave the other relative the opportunity. The other relative did not want to impair his own inheritance to his family, did not want to divide it, did not want to welcome those nephews and nieces into his house because he had limited resources, he thought. He wanted more for himself, he thought. And so Boaz was free, and Boaz agreed then to purchase, to redeem not just the land of his relative, but to also take responsibility and ends up marrying Ruth. Let's continue to read in verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her. The Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be, you, be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. So through this foreign woman, a Moabite woman, Ruth, the lineage continues that results in David, King David, 
And that eventually results in the line of David, the root of David being Jesus. God in His sovereignty and providence includes a foreigner in the lineage of the Messiah. A non-Israelite who gave birth and was a part of the redemptive plan that God had in mind through His Son, Jesus. Now, I just want to say a few words about that. Not about that, but about this whole theme of Redeemer and redemption. Redemption is that you have been bought with a price. Boaz bought the land. He bought Naomi. He bought Ruth to care for them, not as property, but in kindness. In this short four chapters of the book of Ruth, the name, the term redeemer, Goel, is mentioned 12 times. Do you think maybe that's important? The form of that word, Gaal, is mentioned 23 times in four chapters. That there is the business of being redeemed and having a redeemer. In Naomi's case, she went from being bitter and childless to holding a grandchild on her lap and nursing him. She went from being hopeless and without to having been provided for and have everything she needed. She went from having no purpose in her life now to being part of those who cared for the child whose lineage would result in King David. We often think, and we're not wrong, that Jesus being the ultimate Redeemer is the fact that He paid for our sins and bought us with the price of His life. And that is true. But it's also that He restores to our life meaning and purpose. And that's part of Jesus being our Redeemer today. Not just for the forgiveness of our sins, but of giving purpose and meaning to our every day. Christ is our Redeemer. Boaz, who is that kinsman Redeemer, is a foreshadowing of Jesus, who is the ultimate Redeemer of all who will trust in Him. Paul writes in Ephesians, in Him, in Jesus, we have redemption through His blood. And in Galatians, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. That we would be loved by the Father and a part of His family. Again, can you picture Naomi in distress and feeling alone? And now she's embraced and part of the family. So I thought about that in our own life. What are the things that happen in our lives that we need redemption for? Sometimes it's the same experience as Naomi. We've lost our spouse, and we're grieving. And while we might be able to provide financially for ourselves or they provided for us in some manner, there's still something missing. There is still a grief that shows our emptiness. We're not sure of our purpose. Beloved, Jesus can redeem our grief and our loss. He doesn't bring that person back, but He provides an understanding and a context in which your life still has meaning even though that special person is gone. A spouse, a 
parent, a child. I was just talking this morning, today, to, uh, to someone this morning about, um, you know, as we get older, our bodies begin to fail us, right? Like my knees hurt in the morning. Steps are a new challenge. You know, those things happen. And I thought the application of this whole redemption was, how does Jesus redeem our bodies? Well, it could be, and it is, that through science and medical technology, we can, we can have a little bit longer life and a little healthier body through our good doctors and surgeons and those, but ultimately, our bodies still fail. But in the resurrection of Christ, we know that our bodies are redeemed and that we will have new bodies, redemptive bodies that are heavenly and will be eternal. And that's yet another promise of God in being the Redeemer. Jesus is your Redeemer no matter what your need might be. Ultimately, he has died for our salvation. But he has also died and been raised from the dead to be your protector and your provider. Turn to him. Trust in him. He's bought you and he loves you. And you are his. You're a child of the Heavenly Father. A son of in the kingdom that is eternal, a daughter in the heavenly kingdom of God. That's who you are. That's what your redemption in Christ promises. Thanks be to God, we have a redeemer in Christ. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for the example and the foreshadowing of a Boaz who took upon himself the responsibility of redeeming his relative, of providing nurture and care and purpose. We thank you that you have provided for us, your son Jesus, to be our redeemer, to purchase for us our salvation, to provide for us all that is needed and to give us a place and purpose. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Let's stand and sing our final hymn together.
Beloved, so often we are unsure about what's going on in the world around us. But even in the time of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, there were famines and there were wars and there were rumors of wars. But God in His sovereignty always provided for people to know Him and for Him to be their redemption. It is not any trusting in the world around us and systems that we can create. It's trusting in the one who is sovereign and has providence. And he is sending you this week wherever he wants you to be. He is sending you there to do something in you and through you that you might know his purpose for your life and that you would be an instrument of his purpose to others. Remember always nothing Nothing separates us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The gift of Christ, his Son, our Savior, that is our hope. He is our salvation. May the Holy Spirit so fill you that you will have his peace and joy today and always. Amen.